like to welcome to the stage uh, Associate Professor Linda Selvey, the President of the Australasian Faculty of Public Health Medicine, to introduce the Red Fern Oration. Thank you, Linda. Good morning. Um, we, the Australasian Faculty of Public Health Medicine keynote address is um, called the William Red Fern Oration. Now, some of you may not know who William Redfern was. Um, he was a surgeon who was born around 1774 in England um, and died in Edinburgh in 1833. And he came to Australia as a convict um, in 1801 or two um, after escaping the death penalty for his role in the mutiny of Nor in 1797. Um, now, I didn't know what the the mutiny of Nor was, but it was a mutiny of um, naval uh, officers and sailors um, that went beyond uh, just better rights for sailors, but also trying to transform society. And so even, even when he was um, in prison at that time and involved in the mutiny, he was um, doing public health. Um, he was both a pioneer in uh, public health and, and represented the first beginnings of um, public health medicine um, in Australia. Um, he greatly improved the health conditions of the settlement through basic um, public health interventions. So the um, William Redfern Oration um, was instituted in 1994 by our faculty, and it is with um, great pleasure that today I introduce uh, Professor Sandra Eads um, to deliver this oration. She is an Associate Dean Indigenous for the Faculty of Medicine, Dent Dentistry and Health Sciences in the Centre for Epidemiology and Biostatistics within the Melbourne School of Population and Global Health at the University of Melbourne. Sandra, whose family are Noongar from the Minyang, Goreng and Kanyang clans in southwest Western Australia, has made outstanding contributions to the epidemiology of Indigenous child health in Australia, as well as national leadership in Indigenous health research. In 2003, Sandra was Australia's first Aboriginal medical doctor to be, involved, to be awarded a Doctorate of Philosophy, um, which she achieved at the Telethon Institute of Child Health Research in Perth. The same year, she was recognised as New South Wales Woman of the Year for her work in paediatric and perinatal epidemiology, identifying links between social factors such as housing and infant health. She now leads a new NHMRC Centre for Research Excellence focused on Aboriginal child and adolescent health and is a fellow of the Australasian, uh, sorry, Australian Academy of Health and Medical Science. Um, so Sandra represents really the transformation of public health over the couple of centuries um, since William Redfern's time, um, where she brings um, a true evidence base to our work. So it's with great pleasure to introduce Sandra to you today. Thank you. Thank you for the welcome, Linda. Um, and thank you to the college for the invite. Uh, to give this year's Redfern oration. Uh, and thank you to Yoti. Uh, it's terrific to hear of your work over many decades in Indonesia and uh, wonderful to be able to share this morning's session with you. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge um, my Maori and Pacific Islander brothers and sisters and um, the shared work over many years in um, progressing health and uh, well-being for Indigenous people in this region. Um, so I'll put my glasses on. The most difficult way to talk is when the slides are quite a fair way in front of you, but let's see how we go. Um, so Linda told me about the theme of uh, this year's meeting, and our program really is about health across the lifespan. Um, and looking at what we can do to close the gap and improve the life um, of Indigenous uh, people and close the gap. So uh, it's terrific um, having joined the University of Melbourne last year. Um, one of the great events on the calendar is the Garama Festival um, in the top end of the Northern Territory and uh, I'm looking forward to being there again this year. The theme of last year's Garama Festival was truth-telling um, and 
there are leaders. It's like a mini United Nations for all of the Indigenous nations around Australia. So there are just a few things I want to say at the beginning. I want to acknowledge my ancestors. Um, I do have convict ancestors, actually, um, but these are my um, Manang, Goreng, Kaniang ancestors. Uh, Tommy King was a Narangita, a great leader in the Albany region of Southwest WA. My grandparents, Muriel um, uh, Hayward and Ivan Williams, his Aboriginal name was Womba. Um, his father named many of his sons uh, with different words for fire because fire was so important to fire stick farming and land management and to culture and life. Um, and Womba is uh, the sound that fire makes when you have a blazing fire and the wind is, is blowing against those, um, uh, against the fire. Um, and my mother, Gwen Eads, and her husband, Stafford Eads, um, and finally to me. I was born just over 50 years ago, in fact 1967. Um, I'd like to segue in and give a plug for constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians briefly. Um, you know that there's bipartisan support for constitutional recognition of um, Indigenous Australians, so that will be a major issue on the agenda in Australia. Um, in the year that I was born, uh, the previous 1967 referendum occurred. And what was the impact of that? Well, I was one of the first generation of Indigenous Australians um, with access to the mainstream Australian school setting. Um, many people moved off missions and reserves in towns and cities, and we had an improvement, an immediate improvement in um, uh, at public health conditions in which we lived. I don't think we can really predict what the impact of constitutional recognition might be going forwards, um, but I think um, it will be uh, of great importance to public health and we shouldn't just leave it to the lawyers and constitutional experts and politicians, but we should increasingly recognise it as a public health issue and we should join leaders like Fiona Stanley who right now is involved in what might be a public relations campaign um, and planning for that in the event of um, progress with this issue. Um, and this is important. We do have many poor outcomes for Indigenous Australians, but we're projected to have a population of about a million Indigenous Australians by 2028. And it depends whether you accept the lower estimate or the upper estimate of what the population was pre-contact, whether it was about three, 350,000 or a million. But it's a significant milestone. At the University of Melbourne, we want to, we want to produce leaders for the third generation of a shared Australian history. Uh, we want to produce Indigenous leaders. Um, so we have about 400 Aboriginal students enrolled in our degrees at the University of Melbourne, and we've just recently revised that to say that by uh, 2028, we'd, we're hoping to have 1,000 Indigenous students enrolled and be producing leaders, including health leaders. Um, so I've moved in this part to talk about our actual research program. Um, our research has four main aims, um, partnership with Aboriginal communities, um, understanding the determinants of health and wellbeing for Aboriginal people across the life course. And we realise the importance of transitions, not just biological transitions, but social transitions, educational transitions, economic transitions, family transitions, parenting, um, all of those things. And, and our research focuses on understanding. And uh, we also have um, interventions, either using real life um, experiments and quasi-experimental designs or through experimental designs. Um, this slide's very busy. Uh, I'll come back to it later. But it basically uh, uh, outlines um, it's probably at least 15 years of work, um, but it outlines the model and the premise um, with which we work across the life course. Um, so you have from uh, pregnancy, 
in utero, early life, early childhood, adulthood, across there. Um, I'm fortunate that the first half of my training was in a paediatric research institute, uh, the Telethon Kids in Perth with Fiona Stanley, and almost a decade of my work life was at the Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute in Melbourne. So um, I've had the opportunity to, to see and think about how the relationship between early life and later life and chronic disease um, and that, that's really embedded in all of our work. So we, we use mixed methods. We um, work with um, large-scale linked total population data sets. Um, we have a number of epidemiologists and biostatisticians in our team and we're well placed in the Centre for Epidemiology and Biostatistics. Um, since the move to Melbourne uh, last year. Um, we're involved with large-scale collaborations that span multiple states and territories. I have lived and worked in Western Australia, the Northern Territory, New South Wales and Victoria, so a lot of our work follows that footprint. Um, the SEARCH studies a cohort of children 0 to 17 from urban centres in New South Wales. Most of the original cohort was eight years or less, but they now uh, have been running for more than 12 years and with three waves of follow-up. So there are older children they're following up and young adults. Um, the next generation cohort is a cohort of adolescents that we're establishing um, that I'll talk more about. Um, it focuses on young people 10 to 24 years of age. Um, a lot of our data linkage studies are the Seeding Success Project, the Defying the Odds Project, um, and, and one that I'll, I'll share some of the results about is the WAIF study. The WAIF study is the West Australian Aboriginal Intergenerational Fetal Growth Study, and I'll talk to you about the rationale for that study and some of the results which, for me, have been a, a paradigm shifter because you never really know whether how much you can achieve in one lifetime, whether really we need to be thinking about life course across multiple generations. Um, and so uh, that's an important study. We've worked with government to produce reports up in the, in the top corner. Um, we we're really pleased last year with the AIHW to release a national report that focused on the health of Aboriginal youth 10 to 24 years of age. Um, and we've analysed data from the 45 and up study, which is a major study of ageing. And within that study, there are over 1,200 Aboriginal people from New South Wales. Um, and there are papers we've published about chronic disease, the overlap between chronic disease and psychological distress. Um, and we have, I won't talk about it today, but we have a, a, a trial underway. Um, looking at dementia prevention and, um, and really ramping up cardiovascular risk um, management um, and working with communities, understanding that what's good for your heart is good for your brain. Um, I think I've mentioned most things on, on this. We, we also have a philosophy of responding to major challenges and trying to remain relevant. Um, and so some of our we do have some work around child protection. The removal of Aboriginal children is a major contemporary issue. And that's just a, a fledgling program. And we've got the early quantitative parts of that study um, underway. Qualitative, sorry. So um, what what flagged out my interest in into multi... I'll talk about the WAIF's work birth weight over multiple generations, I didn't really understand whether we could really tackle this and make major change within a generation. There's a lot of hype about um, fetal programming, epigenetics, and so for me it was really um, how much progress can we make within one generation? We, can, we published a systematic review in 2012 um, reviewing internationally papers that focused on early life influences on cardiometabolic disease risk in Aboriginal 
populations and what the evidence, the published evidence in longitudinal studies and a small number of case controlled studies, what the evidence was um, for that link between early growth and development in utero and later uh, chronic disease, heart disease, diabetes, kidney disease. Um, and there was strong evidence for a relationship between birth weight, particularly low birth weight, and later uh, type 2 diabetes, impaired chronic, uh, kidney function, high blood pressure. Um, and there was also well-known evidence for exposure to diabetes in pregnancy and later development um, of diabetes. So that was the backdrop to this thinking. Um, a number of the key papers had been published by Wendy Hoy. You're probably familiar with her work. Um, but she spent a long time, particularly in the Northern Territory, trying to untangle this story and see what the associations really were um, and published. Um, these are three of her papers, but published some, um, some, some important work that really shaped our thinking around um, early life and uh, later disease um, and even the risk of death um, with trawling through the archives and linking birth, birth records to death records, um, I think, on the Tiwi Islands. So they were key papers in this review. And it was the backdrop for this, this study. We decided we're not <laughs> collecting um, genetic data and trying to piece together all the genes, but can we do this um, and look at this with total population data. We've published this paper this year. We had a lot of false starts, so it took us almost a decade. Um, but I think it's, Im it's an important demonstration um, of, of what we can achieve within one generation with the right settings. Um, so the work, the work was multi-generational low birth weights amongst West Australian Aboriginal infants, and could we demonstrate any evidence for maternal fetal program? We, um, so we know that high rates of IUGR uh, are, are common amongst Aboriginal um, people. It's associated with health behaviours, including uh, smoking, maternal health during pregnancy, and a range of pregnancy complications. Um, and low birth weight is often used as a marker for IUGR. Um, so, we're exploring whether a poor fetal environment in one generation caused low birth weight in their offspring using routinely collected data from WA. And uh, we were actually looking to prove the relationship, um, but it turned out we didn't find much evidence um, to prove this rela multi-generational relationship. So I'll show you what the story was. Um, so, there is a relationship between maternal and offspring birth weight, um, and these are the sorts of things. Genetic factors affect birth weight, genetic factors affect pregnancy, and a range of environmental factors, um, including smoking in pregnancy, um, maternal health during pregnancy, nutritional environments affect birth weight. So it's a complicated story to disentangle, but what we've tried to do is um, adjust for the bottom three factors and demonstrate a residual factor which would um, be what might be um, represent um, an intergenerational uh, programming effect. Um, and that's very complicated, but it, it's the causal diagram for our model. We've got information on uh, grandmothers and their health during pregnancy. We've got information on mothers, um, their birth weight and other early and later life exposures. And we've got information um, on the infants whose uh, birth weights we're looking at. Um, and so the exposures and outcomes are for this mo these models were a mother being born small for gestational age, and we've also got, also got the mother's birth weight Z score, and we've got whether an infant was born small for gestational age and the infant's birth weight Z score. Um, our sample is tw over 12,000 Aboriginal singletons. Uh, we excluded 
multiple births, born in WA from 1998 to 2011, um, with a gestational age 20 weeks or more, um, and mothers who were born, Aboriginal mothers who were born in WA from 1980 onwards. And we've also got information on fathers. We've got um, five and a half thousand fathers who we've identified through birth registration records. And we've got um, mothers who are siblings. So we've got over two and a half thousand uh, cousins who share um, maternal siblings and the same maternal grandparents in this sample. Um, the data sources are, um, are from birth records from 1980 onwards, hospital and mental health records, birth registrations, and the family connection system. Um, and you can see all of those there. Um, so we had 16% of the sample who were born SGA, small for gestational age, and 84% of the sample who were not born SGA. Um, and 25% of the infants born SG, SGA had a mother who was born SGA, and 15% um, of the infants born SGA didn't have a mother who was born FG, SGA. So you can see that being born small for gestational age um, is associated with um, a higher risk of your um, offspring being born small for gestational age. But you can see that the background risk factors um, and health conditions are not much different between the two groups. There's 10% of mothers hypertensive, uh, 4 or 5% with diabetes, and 1% with gonorrhea or other STIs. So there's not a great health differential um, between the two groups. So our initial regression model, um, we used the full sample and um, tried to control for confounding by adjusting for a range of confounders. Um, and um, I'll show you the results of the initial um, models. So if you're a mother born small for gestational age, um, your offspring um, were about 62% more likely to be SGA themselves than with mothers not born SGA. Um, you can see we did a partial adjustment for genetic effects on growth, and the risk dropped to um, the relative risk dropped to 1.51. And then, when we accounted for many of the environmental factors and um, the associations with the mother's health conditions you can see um, the relative risk drop further to 1.48. Um, but we have this question, so this residual risk, is it residual confounding from genetic factors that influence your growth potential? Or is this residual impact, this multi-generational impact on fetal growth? And that's what we've tried to disentangle in the remainder, and we thought there was our proof for this multi-generational effect on fetal growth and later um, adult disease. And the things that we need to do in public health and clinical medicine really need to occur across um, both generations. But um, what we found, we've, we, we, we've, we looked at mothers and fathers, so in terms of um, infant birth weight, Beta M is the maternal coefficient for the birth weight uh, uh, Z score, and beta P is the paternal coefficient um, for the um, birth weight Z score, and we adjusted for covariates. And we were thinking that if the if we compared the maternal and paternal um, impacts, um, if we, we expected that um, the maternal impact would be greater and beta M would be greater than beta P, P due to um, multi-generational impacts on the uterine environment and um, epigenetic effects that were running along a maternal line across generations. And what we found was that there wasn't a great deal of difference between the impact of 
um, the mother's birth weight and the father's birth weight on the um, coefficient for the fetal birth weight Z score was 0.17 um, for mothers and 0.13 for fathers. And so there was a small um, residual difference. And um, once we fully adjusted for other covariates, um, almost all of that effect disappeared. And if you compare that to other factors, such as a mother smoking in pregnancy, you can see the coefficient, the negative coefficient on fetal growth is much larger at negative 0.39. And in the other direction for diabetes in pregnancy, the coefficient is much larger at over 0.5. Um, so you can see there's a negligible effect in this model, which includes mother's and father's fetal growth and the genetic um, and the contribution to fetal growth. Our third and final approach was, um, was to look at cousins who, who were mothers who were sisters. So 50% of their genetic um, uh, story is contribution is similar. They share similar environments in early life and um, early and in youth. Um, and they've got the same maternal grandparent lineage. So um, we had this model for cousins. You can see we started with the original maternal um, coefficient for birth weight. And um, when we added in the grandparents um, were included in the model, the, the relationship between ma maternal birth weight an infant birth weight was fully attenuated. So in these cousin um, models as well. So our conclusions from our three approaches um, was that both the, regression, the initial regression model, um, the parental model and the cousin models were, was that um, in this large scale study spanning more than 30 years and with more than 12,000 um, births, there was no major evidence, no substantial evidence for intergenerational fetal programming of birth weight. And um, so we find that's a very optimistic support for the sorts of public health programs um, that, uh, that we are all involved in advocating for and running at different at nationally and at state and territory levels. And unfortunately, um, you know, we can see the flow on effects with, uh, as this story evolves with um, maternal diabetes and um, more childhood diabetes and chronic kidney disease in uh, the territory and particularly in remote communities. But for me, this is a very optimistic um, display of um, and a proof that really encourages us to go further um, at resolving a number of the underlying uh, drivers of poor fetal development, early childhood growth um, in tackling chronic diseases and health right across life. Um, so the second, we used the same data for a social transition because we did have to look at birth registrations and I said that social transitions are as important as um, biological transitions. Um, when we looked at these data, we found that roughly, well, there were a lot of birth registrations missing and we thought, is this a failure of the data linkage process or um, are these registrations really missing? Um, and so we looked closer at this. You know that uh, evidence of identity and citizenship, it's a human rights issue. And, um, and um, as you, you can cope okay whilst you're young, actually, you can be enrolled in school, you can get a Medicare card and be on the PBS. But as you get older, it's more difficult to open a bank account, get a driver's license, apply for a passport. And you would think that for Indigenous people, um, this, this really shouldn't be an issue um, living um, in the countries where our ancestors have been for thousands, tens of thousands of years. So we looked at this more closely rather than um, we needed to for the other study, but rather than ignore the issue. Um, we looked at births registered in 2000 and 
actually, these are um, data for the period we were looking at. So um, about 1% of all Australians don't have a birth, birth registration and about 8% of all Aboriginal Australians don't have a birth registration and these were West Australian total population data and we could tell about 15% of all Aboriginal West Australians don't have a birth registration. But using this data, we knew that um, there wasn't a problem with the record linkage and there were birth registrations missing for Aboriginal babies and young people. What are the factors with, with birth registration for babies born to Aboriginal mothers in Western Australia? And, um, and what were the trends? So this is a trend line. There were um, almost 50,000 Aboriginal children born from 1980 to 2010. And over 5,000 or 11% didn't link to a birth registration record. Um, and we've actually modelled in children under 16 years of age, because under 16 you're still dependent upon adults and other people to help you um, complete these um, things. So it, we related it to uh, looking at what are the characteristics of the parents and the families. And you can see the trend line that it goes up to um, over 20% um, and, and peaks in, um, but it does decline over time. So you can see uh, the earliest, the oldest babies were born at the beginning of that curb and were about 30 years of age at the time of this study and the youngest were um, in their first year of life. But you can see that people do go out and register their birth if it's not initially registered over time, but particularly um, around adolescence when it's needed so much more um, for various things. I can't actually see the detail very well on my screen, um, but this is the model which says these are all Aboriginal parents. Um, um, these are all Aboriginal parents, but you can see there's a social gradient within the Aboriginal population in Western Australia. And you can see if you're an Aboriginal mother with private health insurance, um, this is the, the odds ratios for an unregistered birth. Uh, your child's very unlikely not to have their birth unregistered. Um, but other factors which are correlated with remoteness, um, probably along with re remoteness, language um, and access to services. Um, and in urban centres, there are unregistered children and that correlates more closely with markers of social disadvantage. So... Um, so... Um, age at age at birth of your first child, so uh, younger mothers are much likely, mothers who are younger at the birth of their first child are much less likely to have their birth registered and um, you can see smokers, there's a difference with between smokers and non-smokers but uh, younger mothers are much less likely to have their child's birth registered, mothers who smoke are much less likely to have their birth registered and mothers who come from remote and very remote communities are much less likely to. So this is a really, really a story. This is a social transition and of all the things that young adolescents, uh, Indigenous adolescents deal with, what they don't need to also deal with is um, difficulties proving their citizenship and identity um, and having to go through quite a long um, process of having their birth registered. Um, so there were some immediate impacts from this. In Victoria, the Children's Commissioner um, introduced a requirement for all Aboriginal children to have their birth registration forms filled out prior to leaving hospital. Usually you take the form with you, um, you pay a fee and you um, lodge the form with the birth registrations. And We've also noticed that with, in New South Wales with the move to online birth registrations, there's been significant and large improvements in birth registrations and there's also work in Western Australia. So it's not directly a health transition but is a social transition, a citizenship and human rights issue for young Indigenous people. And in the last 10 minutes, I'd just like to briefly um, speak about a study that we're setting up 
um, and that we're recruiting to now and some other work um, related to this, the Next Generation Youth Wellbeing Study. This study was originally called The Forgotten Generation. In writing the grant to get this study funded, we wanted to highlight the deficits but when we um, and the gaps in evidence. And when we, when we went to submit our ethics um, and in discussing the study further with communities, once it was funded, we decided a more optimistic and positive framework was required for this study. So it's called the Next Generation Youth Wellbeing Study. And you all know very well the population pyramids, the very young age structure of the Indigenous um, population in Australia. Uh, and I, I think this generation of the change makers, everything else we do in terms of um, you know, a more medium to long-term approach to health improvement has to involve this age group. But because they don't sit in front of us with, um, you know, a pregnancy, well, they do. 50% of all Aboriginal babies are born to, but they don't, um, you know, necessarily have hypertension or many of the clinical um, conditions that drive um, health service delivery. There are gaps. Uh, we worked with, I think I mentioned earlier, we worked with the, we, we worked concurrently in setting up this study with the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare and we produced a report with them, um, with most of the investigators from this study involved in setting the framework for this report um, and that was released last year in 2018. And there were a number of positive things you know, we wanted to highlight a strengths-based approach. 65% um, had completed year 12, and that's a marked improvement on previous years. Daily smoking rates were dropping uh, for this age group down to 31% in 2014-15. The majority reported having excellent or very good health, and, um, but there were a number of data gaps as well. We've just, in the last week, published uh, a more detailed paper. We've got a um, PhD student looking at uh, another transition. That's the uptake of smoking. Most lifelong smokers take up the life in adolescence. Um, and it's, it's in public health research and practice, and it shows smoking prevalence amongst 15 to 24-year-old Indigenous Australians has declined significantly between 2002 and 2014, and it's fallen 15, 14 percentage points. And this is what we'd like to see in terms of reducing the overall um, smoking rates in, in the total Indigenous population. Um, but there's, there's reason to keep, we're looking at this with other studies, to keep looking at this and to ensure that it's not just a delayed initi initiation of smoking but it's, um, it's part of what we need to be doing um, to continue to tackle smoking. You know, smoking relates to the earlier work around fetal growth and health very early in life. Um, but the aims of this um, Next Generation Youth um, study are to explore the views, firstly, a, a qualitative phase to explore the views and opinions of young people 10 to 24 years of age their parents and carers and youth health care providers about what um, makes, what goes towards good health and well-being, what is well-being in this stage of life, and to establish a longitudinal cohort of Aboriginal young people to examine health trajectories in more detail um, than we can do with national reports which take cross-sectional data from um, various um, uh, routine collections. Our partners are in three, in New South Wales, the Northern Territory and Western Australia. Um, and we've partnered very strongly in Western Australia with two key health services in the southwest of the state and with Congress, um, Central Australian Aboriginal Congress in Central Australia. And we're mainly um, working through the Central Coast and Hunter region in uh, New South Wales and having mixed success because unlike 
pregnant women and babies and older people with chronic disease, you don't find this age group sitting around in health clinics waiting for you to come and recruit them to a study. Um, and they're a very hard to engage group. Um, but it's a fairly classic study design with um, survey, clinical measures, and also consent for data linkage, both the state-based data linkage and Commonwealth MBS and PBS um, data linkage. In fact, the Commonwealth data linkage is much more of a problem because uh, whilst young people and their families will consent to state-based data linkage, they're more um, suspicious of linkage to Commonwealth data sets because they're closer to Centrelink and um, other... So that's been a, an interesting learning from this study. So we're not looking at young people and STIs or young people and mental health or young people and cardiovascular disease. We're trying to take a holistic look at this group, um, you know, with a person-centred and a family-centred and a community-centred approach. So there are six major determinants, uh, components to the overall study. Um, the social determinants, Aboriginal cultural engagement, physical health and injury. Injury is a major um, contributor to uh, morbidity and mortality in this age group. Um, mental health, we've, we've looked at the preliminary results of some of the mental health data um, coming through and we've used that to inform some, um, some new work in the area of mental health. Um, and we all know of the high rates of suicide and self-harm in this age group. But also what we don't talk about so often is the impact of mental health on life transitions the ability to feel positive, engaged with high school and completing high school or transitioning to university or TAFE or further education, um, feeling positive about your life and your life's prospects. Um, so it's, we've taken a broad approach uh, to health risk factors, tobacco, alcohol and other drugs and the issues of fertility and reproduction but also uh, sexual health, sexual risk, risk-taking, STIs are all a part of this. Um, and it's almost, uh, you know, those issues are for the older participants, but it's almost like having two cohorts within one because what you need to, to do to engage 10 to 14 or 10 to 15-year-olds is quite different to what you need to do to engage older um, young people. Uh, we've tried very hard to make it tech savvy um, and, and, and to engage with young people um, in, in this environment. What the major barrier to this is actually literacy and numeracy, particularly in, in Perth, in suburbs with very low rates of adult employment. Um, there are a lot of 10 to 12 year olds who are not literate enough to use an iPad and complete a, a short survey. We had a longer survey and we shortened it um, considerably, but they're still not literate enough to complete this survey. Um, and what worked? Because we just, you know, the study's really, let's have a go and see how to do this. There aren't, um, you know, it's, it's not clear how to engage with this age group. Um, we've worked with community and youth organisations, research and networks, community events, sporting events. We were at the Nikki Widmar and Kirby Bentley AFL football carnival in West Australia recently and recru recruited 160 young people to the study. Um, youth clubs and youth specific um, services. We've had minimal um, uh, progress with schools. We've just got recently got um, ethics approval to work with schools in New South Wales but we don't have ethics permission in the NT and WA, so we haven't been able to work closely with schools. Um, but really, a lot of the, the engagement is through community neighbourhood centres. In, in, it's not, not health sporting events and community neighbourhood centres. This was our recruitment to March, um, to March 2019. We had just under 400 young people and, and 
um, a total of about 500 participants, including parents and carers who were informants for the younger age group. Um, and most recently, looking at the data, we've got uh, about 550 young people and 750 participants overall. So we're pretty confident we'll have a cohort of over 1,000 young people by the end of this year. Um, but where did we succeed? We employed Aboriginal staff. Um, we have virtually no non-Indigenous staff, one or two in some locations, but it's Aboriginal staff um, managing the research groups in each of those locations, networking with community organisations and events. Um, we, do, we do reimburse both parents and young people for their time and provide catering. We've had, we actually, it's hard to measure our success with um, social media, but we do have a social media strategy. Um, but um, some of the, these are some of the challenges, just briefly, um, but it has taken us a while. So in, I'd just like to conclude, um, and you know, that's an outline of our work, our, you know, our framework for a life course approach to Indigenous health improvement. It's essential. For a lot of my career, I thought we needed two or three life courses to have the impact. But our work, particularly with multi-generational fetal growth, growth, is a paradigm shifter for me. It shows me that we can be much more optimistic and positive about what we can improve within one generation if we get the settings right, both at a societal level and right down at a family community level and a health services level. Um, public health has multiple impacts across the life course and, again, to reinforce that health change within a generation is possible. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Sandra, for your um, fascinating and um, presentation demonstrating what is possible um, with indigenous, indigenous leadership for Indigenous research. So it's with great pleasure now that I'd like to present to Sandra um, the William uh, Redfern uh, Oration Medal uh, for 2019. If you come 